Okay, all set. Okay, great. Okay, thank you, uh, Rosemary, and thank you, Emily, for having me on tonight. Um, it's always a pleasure to be back at both of your libraries to do one of my uh, talks. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about small space gardening for people who don't have a backyard or traditional uh, backyard or garden space to grow, who many people who uh, live in apartments and condos either have a tiny space outdoors or they have a, a balcony or veranda or, or a patio uh, that's not really in the soil, but they can do things with pots and, and planters and such. So I came up with this talk for those, actually was at the instigation of the uh, head librarian of uh, Cranford Library. She said, Tony, you know, we have a lot of people in town that live in apartments, particularly the seniors, and they would love to have a way to garden. Can you make a program for them? So that's how this program came to be. And it's been very successful. And uh, um, what I do is I, just because you don't have a, a, a traditional garden in the traditional sense where you have a yard or, or a side yard or whatever, this you can still have the same amount of fun, fulfillment, and, and, and recreation by having your own garden. Even a small garden can produce, a small patio garden or, or a small space garden can produce a tremendous yield if you do it correctly. So uh, I've come up with a program where I'm going to show, we're going to do it in three parts. I'm going to talk about sourcing seed, soil preparation. Uh, we're going to talk about what to grow, uh, how to grow it, and then we'll, I'll show some slides of different types of small space gardening to give you ideas. And I can send the pictures to you as well. Um, and then we will show some of the hand tools that we use. We use them at the farm when we work in our greenhouse and they just can be adapted to working in a small space garden. So what I'm going to do, I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna start uh, by showing some, um, here we go. Okay, before we start any, the most important thing we need, and, and you probably know today, everybody's talking about sourcing seed, uh, uh, keeping seed for the future, because we're worried about the supply chain and the food chain. And um, it's, a, it's a good idea to, to store some seeds, but you have to do it properly. You have to make sure that they're not in a humid uh, uh, area. They should be in, in a dry spot. They should not be packed in plastic. They should be kept in either a paper, any type of paper bag, a paper envelope, something that's porous that they can get airflow around them and keep something that's, that they, can, they can take temperature swings, but you really, the, the humidity is probably the worst thing um, uh, will affect them more than a temperature swing will. And seeds will last for years if you store them properly, even though they have an, uh, an expiration date on some of the packages, it's not necessarily true. They can last for years. Uh, you know, they found seeds in, in, in Italy and in Pompeii that they that still germinated after 2000 years because they were stored in these jars properly. So you can, you can do that. You can keep them for a long time as long as you do it right. And what I have been, since we had the farm, um, I found by talking with other farmers and talking with our agricultural agent that uh, there are a lot of seed sources. What I have on this list here, I didn't even know any of these even I can't even get out before I before I had the oh, farm. I would just on. go to uh, to uh, my Home Depot or I'd go to local garden center or hardware store and I would find the seeds that they had there. And typically there's nothing really wrong with the seeds that are there, except that they might be old, they might have been mishandled. You really don't know. Um, I would get my seeds from one of these sources here and I'll go over a few of them um, with you. So uh, the thing is that you wanna have something that's reliable. On, on a good package of seeds, you'll have a germination rate on it that'll tell you how many of the seeds in that package should you, you should expect to come up. So if you buy a package of tomato seeds or, or, or even spinach or whatever, it'll say 98%, 95%. And that'll tell you how many you should expect out of that. So if you buy a package of 100 seeds, 95 of them should come up, if not all of them. And that's 
one thing you really want to make sure of because there's nothing worse than buying a pack of seeds and then putting them in the ground and then nothing comes up and then you got to start again. Meanwhile, if you lost maybe a week or if you lost seven, eight days and you have, now you have to start from scratch and wait another eight days. Because we do have a, a we live in a temperate area. The season is pretty long, but it's not, uh, you know, maybe six months you might have of growing. So time wasted is not good. So, uh, but these so seed sources here, you can buy anything from a package of 20 seeds or whatever, 25, up to 50 pound bags of, of so 100 pound bags of seed. And they're no more expensive than if you found them in your Home Depot or your Lowe's or your, uh, your local hardware store or garden center. And um, I'll just go over a couple of, I don't want to review all of them, but you can check them out for yourselves. I'll put all the websites on. Um, the one that we use, the, the, uh, the uh, vendor of choice for us at the farm is Johnny Seeds. Some of you probably have heard of them. They're a very good uh, seed company. They've been around since 1976. Uh, most of the seeds that they have are, are either hybrid or organic. They don't use any GMOs. They have the non-GMO pledge. Um, and they have a great source of, of, of seeds for your typical everyday seeds from, you know, to anything that's uh, exotic and heirlooms and heritage. Good choices. They have some good tools for sale, some supplies. Uh, and when you call them up to order seed, I always recommend ordering seed in person, uh, I mean, on, on the phone, because you can get a lot of information. These people are on the other end are not just people answering the phone, they really are knowledgeable. So if they run out of a particular variety, say you want a variety of zucchini, but they ran out of it, they can suggest another one that's similar to it and uh, in price and in, in whatever the variety was. So uh, all of them, all these, these sources here, you'll get a person on. Um, high, home High Mowing Seeds is a good company too. They're in uh, Vermont. I Johnny's is in Maine, these guys are in Vermont. The one that I really like for gardeners, I think is the most important one on here, uh, is Seed Savers Organization. They're a great organization. They are, uh, they, what they do is they get heirloom and heritage seeds that can trace the lineage back in some cases hundreds of years from either Europe, South America, North America, Africa, Asia. And uh, they've been keeping the, the generations of seeds going. So if you want a particular type of, let's say, uh, sauce tomato, Roma or, or San Marzano tomato, you look on the page there, it'll tell you this tomato originated in this town in Italy in 1840. And then it was brought over not the original seeds, but I mean, they, they've gener generationally, they've, they've kept them going. So you get, you get really high quality seed. And in many cases, you can get something exotic that really nobody else, you wouldn't find anywhere else. Any type of, of tomato, they have a, a vast amount of tomatoes, of varieties, um, peppers, eggplants, zucchini, lettuces. You look through their catalog, it's, it, it's, um, it's really, really something. And you can join their organization I think it's like $40 a year and you get a magazine four times a year with all kinds of tips and what to how to grow things and do things. And then they send you, a, I think, a, a catalog of all the seeds that they have available um, in storage. I think they send that out once a year. And that's a really, really good, uh, really good company. Uh, the other ones are all good. Uh, Fedco, Hudson Valley is right here in Poughkeepsie, I think. If you like onions and you want to grow onions and uh, scallions and shallots, Dixondale Farms, you can buy the live plants, you can buy the seed, or you can buy the bulbs. Um, if you're just starting out with uh, onions, I suggest either using a bulb or a, or, a, or a seedling because sometimes starting onions from seed is a little tricky and you have to do it at the right time. It's all about timing and uh, temperature of the soil and everything. So it's a little tough, but you can do it. Um, Harris seeds are good. There are two companies I put down on the bottom that are supply houses, Nolts Produce Supplies. Um, they're out in New Holland, Pennsylvania. They sell pretty much anything from tomato cages, tomato steak, tomato twine, boxes, berries, boxes, baskets, whatever you might need, tomato steaks, uh, tomato cages, whatever you might need to uh, maintain your garden, different fertilizers. They sell some seed, um, but they sell it in big bulk. So I, I wouldn't go there. Uh, Grower Supply is in Connecticut. They're another good supply house if you're for growing indoors, like greenhouses, things of that type, hoop houses, greenhouses. 
and they have a lot of, a lot of, of information. They have a lot of uh, supplies for that type of growing, but they're all good. All these companies are really good to, to do it. Um, so then from here, so now that we've got our seeds, let's go to what are we going to grow? So let, what can we grow? So I have some handouts here, which I will make available to everybody. Um, so the most, uh, one of the most important questions is citing your garden. Um, unfortunately, if you're in, a, uh, in, a, in an apartment type situation or a high rise and you're on the shady side of the building, it's going to limit you to what you can grow. Um, if you're on the sunny side, you're going to, you know, you get six hours of sun a day. It's going to be great. Um, so full sun, you, that's what full sun typically means, about six hours or more of sun a day. Partial shade can mean anything from an hour or two to three, to maybe an hour to three hours of sun a day. Um, unfortunately, and I say this all the time when I talk, the things that, that grow in the full sun tend to be the things that we like the most, you know, like our tomatoes, our eggplants, our our cucumbers, corn and carrots and basil, and the things that uh, not so much, maybe sometimes like broccoli and, and cauliflower and, and uh, mustard greens, things that we don't really, are kind of like second string, grow really great in the shade. So, uh, so but there are some good things. You're gonna be relegated mostly to like leafy green type things that are gonna grow in the shade. Uh, so you'll get good uh, spinach growth, Swiss chard, radishes, even some root um, crops um, like radishes, which are bulbs and, and beets will grow well in shade. Um, beans typically grow better. Um, so you know, again, you'll have to work with what you have. And if it means sometimes if you're in complete shade, you may have to get some sort of a grow light just that you can put on a couple hours a day, like a UV light to give uh, simulated sunlight to the, if you really insist on growing uh, things that grow in full sun. You may have to do that, um, but uh, it is what it is. That's why it's small space gardening. We 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 have to go with the hand that we're dealt and work with it and do the best we can. So that's the that's, that's the uh, full sun and partial shade thing. And then I get asked about um, perennials. Perennials are most um, most vegetables tend to be annual. There are a few perennials that come up every year. Uh, asparagus is really the number one when you just cut the, the crown off and then it comes up again the next year. Uh, rhubarb, rhubarb is almost as bad as mint. It just keeps coming up. Um, some types of spinach, particularly a New Zealand type is, an, is a, is a, is a uh, perennial. Some sweet potatoes, watercress, yams, things like that. Radicchio, as long as you don't cut too low to the ground, it'll just keep coming back. Um, artichokes. Uh, most herbs, most of your herbs are are uh, perennials because they just could, they come up every year. Um, oregano, parsley, rosemary, all those are are regenerative. They just keep coming up every year. You cut them back. What we do at the farm, especially with our um, we grow a lot of oregano. We cut it back at the end of the season. This way, in the spring, we get a fresh crop. The root ball stays alive, and then you get next. You know, your next crop is, is on the way in the spring. We already have, uh, I looked, we already have the new, the new uh, oregano coming up. It's all tiny, but it's, it's starting to come through, even with this cold weather. It likes cold weather. Um, fruit, fruit, most fruit, 99% of fruit is a perennial because why? Because they're trees. You have trees and you have um, uh, bushes. And uh, so, so, uh, you'll have like raspberries and strawberries or perennials, they'll come back. Strawberries may peter out after five years uh, and you may have to replant um, unless you take the crowns and you just keep letting them reroot. Um, raspberries, the canes keep coming up every year, cut them back. Same thing with blackberries and such, uh, but all the rest, currants, dates, uh, grapes, of course, grapevines can live for hundreds of years. Um, but most of our trees, are, our fruit trees are perennials because they're trees. So that's one thing to look at. And, and when you're growing in a small space type of garden, you can use, you can get the dwarf trees and put them in a large planter. And this way you can have the uh, fun of having a little mini orchard while you're growing your vegetables too. So there's no reason why you can't have some fruit. So we have that. And then uh, people ask me about um, um, companion planting. 
I'm sure we've all heard the story about how if we like um, the, the Native Americans grew the corn and they put the uh, squash next to it and the, and the beans because they would climb up the corn stalks and keep the weeds down. And there is truth to that, it works. Um, so, but when you're planting other things like, let's say tomatoes, you don't have to plant the carrots like right on top of them, especially if you're in a small space garden, you can put some a tomato plant in one pot and then some carrots in another pot, put them near each other. Because a lot of times they, they change gases, uh, who needs more uh, carbon dioxide, who needs more oxygen, so they, who needs more nitrogen, some plants emit the nitrogen, some plants use the nitrogen, so you have the ones next to each other that kind of help each other. And, uh, and it's more, it's easier to do in, and especially in a small space thing, because you, it's a modular situation where you can move things around. And if we did them, if we uh, plant them at the farm, if we plant something next to each other, it's in the next row typically, and there's space in between. We don't put them right on top of each other, which is never a good idea to do. Um, and then to extend your season, you can do what's called a mid-season growing, because a lot of times, a lot of things that we grow, particularly radishes and such, will be ready rather quickly. And then we can put a second or third, even a third, fourth crop in with radishes. You can you get a, you may get a crop every two or three weeks. So as soon as when you plant uh, the first week into your planting of radishes, as soon as the greens come out and they start to grow, plant a succession plant to get another row going, and then a week later another row, and you'll have radishes all we all all season. Um, until the frost, and you'll have them. Same thing with beets, plant your beets and then plant them a second planting. Um, what we do at the farm, we have uh, summer squash. We put our first crop in by seed, usually the end of May. So when they start to come up, maybe two or three weeks later, once they start to form a nice plant, then we'll put more rows in. And this way we have them going all the way to the first frost. And you can do that particularly with these well, that I have here because some of them <clears throat> will do very well up to the first frost, even past the frost. They're, 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 some of them will survive, like the carrots will probably su will survive early frost, so will cabbage, cauliflower, collard greens, um, things of that, but um, not so much cucumbers. Once it gets cold, they'll die. Swiss chard and turnips will survive after a frost. Actually, kale will become sweeter after the first frost. The kale actually becomes more uh, sweet and, uh, and it'll last. We had our kale this year at the farm. It lasted until January when it got really cold and it died. But um, it was very, very hardy. And we grow a variety called uh, winter boar, which I recommend. Uh, it's a very hardy variety. It makes a very, very nice dark green plant, dark green leaves, excellent. Um, a little side note, like when you grow broccoli, if you do grow broccoli in your garden, don't throw away the leaves. I, you can eat the leaves. The leaves, believe it or not, have been known to have more nutritional value than the broccoli head itself. Um, what you can do with the leaves are you, you get them when they're nice and big and green and cut them. Um, leave, of course, some leaves on there, but take some of the big ones and then you uh, cut them and, and saute them in garlic and olive oil. And it's it's like having broccoli without all the without all the trouble. You know, it's like, it's really great. So these are things that you can learn to do. And so that's our, our, um, our uh, mid-season uh, growing. So then what I also have is a, I prepared a, um, a, um, a, a handout also that shows publications. And I've, I've looked at most of these publications and they're pretty good for people who have small spaces to grow. Um, the really very small space vegetable gardens by Andrea Bellamy is a very good book. Um, the library may even have some of these, I don't know. Uh, pocket gardens, which are like the name suggests, very tiny gardens. Big ideas for small spaces, great book. Vegetable gardeners containers Bible. This is really a great book. How to grow in all different types of containers. Uh, the balcony gardener, the, the name speaks for itself. There are a couple of magazines, but the magazines tend to be online, they're not in print. So it's very hard to find a small space magazine in print, but they are online and you can download the PDF. And then if you want, you can print it out. So once you have all this uh, under your belt, what you wanna do is you um, spring preparation. 
what you want to do. I have this, I printed this out from a um, ag extension uh, service. Now, when I all talk about ag, ag extension, I mean, every state has a uh, Department of Agriculture has an ag extension agent in every county in the United States. And in New York, they're based out of Cornell University. In New Jersey, they're based out of Rutgers. So uh, you can look at their, typically if you go to their websites of Rutgers, you go to the Ag Extension section, they'll tell you who the Ag Extension agent is for your county, and you can call that office. And if you have a problem with, with any kind of bugs and things or pests, they can direct you and they can help you. And the, the websites themselves are loaded with information on almost every problem or how to grow anything. They are so helpful and it's all free. So uh, that's where I got this for preparing the garden for spring planting. I mean, we're not, we, we don't have time to go over it all, but you can see what's on there. Soil condition, soil testing. Soil testing is very important. Um, not so much in a container garden, because what you're gonna do is you're probably gonna, if you're starting with different containers, you're probably gonna go to the store and get some topsoil and potting soil and uh, maybe a little bit of uh, uh, fertilizer and some peat moss and mix that all together. But it's always good to have a soil testing kit. And uh, I just happen to have one right here. And um, this is called the rapid test. So it's always good to test your soil because what you wanna do is you wanna test for pH, the acidity or alkalinity of the soil, which can really affect your, 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 your crop growth. So uh, what, these, what this test kit tests for the pH it tests for and like potash and, and potassium and nitrogen that's in the soil. And you, you mix a little soil with water, water in here, drop one of the color coded tablets in and wherever it appears on the screen, like here, whatever the color is, it'll tell you if you need something, if the soil's perfect. And then you add the little bit of amendment that you might need. And I'll include, uh, I have some handouts on that, which we won't really go over tonight, but they kind of take you by the hand and they tell you how to do it. But a kit like this, you can get online on Amazon, $20. It'll last you like 10 seasons at least, um, maybe more. And uh, I'll put the link where you can find this also. So if you read through this on your, on your own, you can see uh, there's a lot of information here on soil types, how to prepare the soil, whether you prepare it in a pot or you, whether you prepare it on, on, on the ground. In the garden, it's the same thing. Um, what you might want to do is in the small space garden is get yourself a big tub and mix a lot of the soil in there and get it all ready and then distribute it through on the, your pots. I wouldn't do it individually for each one, try to make a big, big mound as much as you can, as much as your space will let you uh, do that. Um, let's see, we have... Um, there are other handouts that I have. Uh, let's see what I wanted to go over. Oh yeah, I wanted to talk about the crop pH, that's it. Um, when I say pH, this is a great example. This, will, this is a good scale to keep with you and to re refer to when you wanna see how your soil's doing. When we look at the green area, um, that's the sweet spot. That's where you want it to be when you are growing. And that's where you want the soil to ideally be, somewhere in that green area. And if you look at the chart below, between 6.0 and 7.5 or 8 seems to be where most things grow anyway. So if you have your soil in that range, then everything's going to be good. If it's too acidic, you may have to add a little bit of lime. If it's too alkaline, you may have to add a little bit of sulfur so uh, to, uh, to, to neutralize the soil as much as you can. And a little bit goes a long way. You never want to use a lot. Uh, so th this is a great, again, I'm going to make all these available to you. Composting, uh, people ask me about that too. What can I put in my compost pile? Um, there are things that, you, most things you can, there are things you don't wanna put in. You don't wanna put any oils in or any grease in the compost pile. You don't wanna put any bones and things like that in there. Um, uh, but you put things like fruits and vegetable waste, eggshells are great. Coffee grounds and filters, the filters are biodegradable, tea bags. The bag is biodegradable. Nutshells, shredded newspaper. I'd be a little bit careful because if the newspaper is still is printed with an oil-based ink, a petroleum oil-based ink, you really don't want that in your food source. Always look for something that's soy-based, and they'll usually tell you if it's soy-based ink. And you can go by the smell too. It has a different smell than it doesn't have that typical gasoline oil kind of smell. It's more of a sweet smell. 
Um, you can use paper, yard trimmings. When they say yard and glass grass clippings, you want to make sure the lawn was not sprayed with any chemicals. Um, you know, that lawn doctor didn't come in there and do it, and then you're going to cut those clippings and put them in your compost bin because you're going to get a lot of, uh, you know, weed killer, bug killer, and all that in your, you don't want that in your food source, okay? So uh, any old house plants that have died, hay and straw are good, leaves, sawdust works great, wood chips, cotton and wool, why? Because they're natural, they're, they biodegrade, even hair and fur. Fireplace ashes are ideal. They really help neutralize the soil. They do real, really, really, really good for you. Um, to put in your soil. And then they have reasons why, what not to compost things that you shouldn't put in like meat, but we already mentioned fats and grease and oils. Any diseased plants, don't throw, throw them away. If there's a disease of fungus or if there's mildew or something, a powdery mildew or fungus on your plants, don't put them in your compost because you're just going to make the situation really bad. Um, pet waste, you don't want to put anything like that, anything treated with chemicals. And then you can read through this. Uh, again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on all these because we have a lot to, to talk about. Um, and where to compost. In size, if you have a small space garden, you can get yourself a small drum, put some holes in it, and then you can start filling it up with your things. But just have a way that you can mix it a little bit, um, put a cover on it so it gets nice and warm in there. And, uh, and then you, you can start taking from, usually start taking from the bottom. So it's usually good to have a door at the bottom or opening where you can get it because that's where it's going to get done first. So that's what you can do with that. So it's very good. And I also found another great piece of information, uh, eight steps for the, uh, for the uh, home gardener. So you can read through this. I give you a lot of reading material here, how to have a nice garden at home. And again, it's, it's it, everything that they do here pertains to whether it's a small space or traditional backyard garden. It works for that too. So I'm gonna give you all these different things too. And um, sometimes you might need some fertilizer. Uh, I, I, I downloaded these two pieces from two different, I think I got this one from Rutgers, which I'll give you too. Um, if we go, this tells you, you wanna buy a burst basic, if you need fertilizer to keep your soil, uh, up because you can't make a, you don't have access to a, um, a compost pile or you can't do a compost bin, you don't have the room, get yourself a good home fertilizer. And you, you don't want to buy miracle Grow or anything synthetic. You want to use natural. You want to keep your garden as natural as possible. So you get something that's called 10-10-10 or 10-5-10. And what that is, it's, uh, the, what's, it's the nutrients that are in the fertilizer that are uh, that are best for the plants, such as nitrogen, potash, and phosphates. That's what makes them grow really good. If you ever notice, sometimes the phosphate washes off from farmland into water. What happens? The algae grows like crazy because it's just fertilizing the water. So, uh, so a little goes a long way. You buy yourself a small bag, get it at a garden center. Don't get it at Home Depot. They have all these big national brands. You'll pay a lot of money and it won't be as good as if you get something at your garden center. A small bag, five pounds will last you for years. You're just going to add a little bit and mix it into the soil. So, um, and then I have one more that I want to show you. Then we'll get into some pictures of different types of um, small space cars. This one I got from the University of Washington, and this one's really great. It takes the typical things that people will grow in their garden, the most basic. And, and that's my tip for all of you. If you're first time gardeners, <clears throat> don't get into anything exotic. Do the tried and true things, the tomatoes, the eggplant, the zucchini, if you have room for the zucchini or the peppers. Peppers and eggplant will grow nice and tall. Um, they don't need any sticks to hold them up. They're self-supporting and they grow up. Some tomatoes, the ones that if you're growing tomatoes, get what's called determinate tomatoes. They only grow to a certain size and then that's it. If you get indeterminate, they're just going to keep growing and vining and you'll, have, you'll be spending half your time <clears throat> pruning and uh, but unfortunately, most of your cherry tomatoes are indeterminate and as your heirlooms are too. So if you want them, just prepare, be prepared to do a lot of trimming. And always trim a lot of the bottom of the tomato plant too, because the tomato plants can be prone to powdery mildew and mold. So you want to keep them, you want to keep a lot of air around them. You don't want a lot of moisture at the base. So this thing, this one here will do the same thing. It'll tell you 
how much you need for, for how much if you're doing rows or small rows, large rows, how much you should put per per row, per cup, or whatever. If you read through it, it's very self-explanatory. I think it's three pages long. Yeah, and it's really good. I even show you how to apply it. So it's very, very good to have these. Um, there are two kinds of um, fertilizer that I recommend for, for gardeners. And we use it at the farm too when we do our transplants. There's a product called, um, see if I can get it to open here. Yeah, Biotone. It's an organic starter. And it's really, it's like great plant food and it's all organic. So if you're doing a little transplant or even if you plant your seeds and just sprinkle a little Biotone around or pull, throw a little bit in the hole before you put your little seedling in and it'll feed the plant for the whole season. And um, if you want to get uh, a good yield on your stuff, you can also add a little bit of what they call bumper crop, which is really good too. And the name is self-explanatory because when you use it, you'll get a bumper crop because it's really good. It's really good so organic soil builder. And you get these at your nursery. You won't find these in any box store. You'll have to go to a nursery to get them. And I can give you, I'll make sure I include that information too. So now that I talked a lot, um, I'm going to show you uh, some, some slides of different types of small space gardens. Let me close this, close my tabs. All right, let's see, uh, let's go to small spaces. Okay, here we go. So now what we have here is, um, some people will not have a lot of space. They may have a patio or they may have just a balcony and they don't really, they only may have three or four feet of space that they could typically grow in, but you can go vertical. That's the nice thing about it. You can go as high as you can reach. Um, now, something like this, you can probably find in a garden center or a, 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 some sort of, even unpainted furniture stores may have some of these things. You can look around and just, put a little wood preserver on it, natural, like I, I make my own wood preserver. Um, I make it out of mineral, uh, natural mineral spirits and linseed oil. And then I just give a few coats with a brush or a roller and it makes it waterproof. You never wanna use treated lumber, either on your garden boxes, raised beds or anything because it has a lot of chemicals in it. You wanna use natural fir, pine, boards, things like that. Um, and then give them a coating of a natural, which I will also have a handout on that. I'll make sure you get that too. So that we have here is a, a vertical way to go. And then you can put something, you can do herbs, uh, you can do um, lettuces, you can do whatever. These people are doing a mixture of ornamentals and uh, some sort of like, looks like they have rosemary growing there, a little bit of uh, oregano, maybe some basil. Um, so you can do that as well. Um, so that's another way to go. Um, here we go. This is a nice one, a nice design if you just want to attach something to a wall. Again, this is very ornate and very involved, but you can do it on a simplistic way. If you're handy with tools and you can build one, or you can even find them in the store. And you can just, uh, this way, if you have an empty wall, you can use it to your advantage, again, going vertically. Now here you can see they have all herbs growing in all these. You can see chives and, and lettuces and all types of, it's hard to tell, but I can see, I think I see basil there. I know I see oregano and uh, rosemary, maybe even some thyme, but it's great for, for uh, I would use the top ones for the things that like to grow really hot. So you can do that as well. Um, let me see here. This one, I like what they did with this. This is, um, they just went vertical. They, they got, it looks like they used an old fence, an old picket fence, and then they just hung pots and shelves from it. And again, you have a mixture of ornamentals and herbs. And again, you can see it's on a balcony. It also looks very appealing. They put some sort of netting, keep the birds out and keep it from flying in <clears throat> and eating your hard earned and hard work uh, that you've put into your garden. So that's a great idea, a little bit of netting. You know, a fish net, it also looks attractive. Uh, you can do that as well. Um, let's see what we have here. This is a very popular, what's very popular now, even horizontally and vertically, is um, pallets. Pallets have become really in, as far as gardening is concerned, um, in places where you have, have a yard or a traditional soil garden, you can lay it down a pallet, remove every other plank, 
put some soil in there, and then you can plant your plants in between, and then the other planks act as a weed block. But in a case like this, where you're on a, on a balcony or a wooden deck, you can go vertically and hang pots, and you can also hang uh, you know, rectangular planters from there too. Uh, so, and it also leave it old fashioned looking, it gives it that rustic old fashioned look. And uh, pallets, believe it or not, you can get them for nothing. If you drive past a tile store or stores like that type or stone place, a lot of times they have piles of them outside and they say, take them free. So if you see them, take them because they're really, really well constructed and uh, nobody wants them, you know, they, especially if one or two of the boards are broken. So what? You just take them. They're really good. And it gives a nice look to it. But again, you could apply a little bit of um, linseed oil to it and then bring out the grain, make it look attractive too. Um, here we go with this. Yeah, this is nice. This is a great idea if you make some shelving and you want a, a space between you and your neighbor. So let's say you share a balcony and uh, some people put screens up or whatever piece of fence, you can put up um, a nice planter and then you can use that as a, a privacy screen. The only thing is you may have to share some of the crops with the neighbor on the other side. Um, so, but you can do it again. This looks like it's mostly on ornamentals, but it's a great idea. It has a nice rustic look uh, and it's great to work with because like all the space that's growing vertical, imagine if it was horizontal, it would take up a lot of the deck, but here it takes up nothing. So you have to think in a small space, think vertically, you know. Um, here we go with, again, using a bunch of boxes, just stacking them, you know, like a chessboard. And you can do, uh, fill them up with um, all different things, grasses on the top. These are all different herbs. And um, you, know, you can just really have a good time with it. And you can, the nice thing about this design is you can, you can take away or you can add, you know, as, as, as much as you want to grow more, add some more boxes. You want to grow less, take some boxes away or put flowers in them. So you can do things like that too. Um, and here, this is a nice one. They must've had somebody make this or they found it somewhere. I like, it's like a little pyramid thing. It looks like the first two rows of basil and then it looks like they have some ornamentals and then it looks like some more herbs. It looks like sage at the top. So again, it's really, it's really a, a nice idea and you can grow on all four, three or four sides. I don't know if this is a pyramid or if it's four sides, but you can do that too as well. Um, here we go with, this is like a nice, just a view of a, again, they did mostly ornamentals, but I, I, I picked it because I like the layout. If you want to put some bushes like uh, raspberry bushes there, the pots where the cat is and hanging baskets, you can put um, onions in those, carrots, uh, lettuces, whatever you want. And uh, again, it's, it's off the floor, so it's hanging off the side of the, on the, on the banister kind of thing there. So on the railing, you can, or hanging off the side and you still don't sacrifice a lot of space that you may want to have just for seating or you can have your bring a little breakfast table out there or whatever. Um, it's, uh, that's really enjoyable to do. Again, here, these are all only, all, looks like ornamentals, but what a great idea if you wanted to put raspberry and blackberry bushes, and then you want to have a row, you could put um, all types of, you could do anything in these rows. You can put herbs, you can put lettuces, um, things like this, a, a nice linear path lends itself really well to a row of, of lettuce. Um, different types of lettuces grow really well in a situation like this because they don't require as much sun as uh, other crops do. <clears throat> this one I like because this one they really turned their 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 um, balcony into a into a nice uh, what do you call it situation here where they have all tomato plants on the left here they have a, a, probably a, a dwarf tree um, again some I can't tell what that is maybe some sort of um, uh, beans or whatever. Then again, they did lettuces and you can see they have things, different stages of coming up. And I suggest if you can, uh, we all like the terracotta pots, but the problem with terracotta is they crack and they break a lot, especially if there's a frost. I, as much as I hate to admit it, you, you might want to get a, 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 a you know, re, a polyethylene ones, the plastic ones. Um, make sure that they're a little thicker and you can even check if they're safe for growing plants in for edibles. They do make them so they're, they're non-toxic and they, they last a lot longer. I don't, I, my, I like terracotta because it's natural, 
But if you're in an area where it's not going to freeze a lot, yes, then you can do it. Um, but it's a little difficult to, to, to keep it. This one I like too, because they actually they put a table, a few chairs, and surround themselves with, again, it's mostly ornamentals, but you know, if you want ornamentals, that's good. You could do a row of, of flowers on top. You could do your another row of, of edibles. Um, so you want to just make it, make it uh, to what you're what you you what you like. Um, let's see what we have here. Again, then now this one is very functional. It's not very appealing, but the, the five gallon pails are the are the really a lot of people who do a lot of small space gardening use five gallon pails and they are really great because they're nice and deep and you can get good root systems going, especially if you want to grow things like potatoes and beets and things that are going to go down. Um, you have the room in these five gallon pails. They don't look that appealing. You may want to spray paint the outside. I like what this person did here. They just made three tiers. You could do two tiers. I think they even probably sell this. You can probably buy it. You can probably buy it for two or four or, or three. Um, buckets that you can put in. And the buckets are so inexpensive. And like I say, if you paint them or you put a little design on, they don't look that industrial, but you will get a lot of yield. Out of these 12 boxes, you could get a lot of vegetables out of that. Um, here's another one where they just did it. It looks like they got the, the red buckets and uh, they made them, they painted their frame a little bit. So it kind of looks more appealing. And these are all tomato plants in there, you can see. Uh, so each one tomato plant per bucket, you'll get a really good yield. And they're nice and deep that you can put your tomato cage or your tomato steak and can go down nice and deep in there, and not worry about it falling over. And it's going to keep a lot of pests out too, which is really good, nice and high. So you want to think of things to consider when you're, when you're thinking about your small space. Um, then they also make them, you know, these planters are nice. You can actually use them either just to put soil in maybe put a little bit of a liner on the inside or coat it with the linseed oil mix, or you could put three or four buckets inside. And once everything starts to grow, you won't even see the buckets anyway. And they can be modular. You take the buckets out, you can clean it, move them. They're very nice. They're very, that's a very nice idea. I like that. Um, what we have here too is, this is just a typical, somebody using their garden to do with basic buckets, gray ones, white ones, and then having some rectangular planters and it looks like they're growing a lot of uh, spinach in one, lettuce in the other, herbs over here, there's lettuce up there. So you can, you know, you can do a lot. I would recommend growing in, in buckets if you like blackberries in one, uh, you know, one plant of black, one cane, because they will spread out and you can do blackberries, you can do raspberries. Uh, strawberries, I would do more in, in, a, in a flat planter, I wouldn't do them in the bucket because they're going to spread out. <clears throat> then we have here, this is a nice one uh, where you have all different type size pots. Looks like they have plastic, terracotta, it's all mixed. And they use tables and everything, chairs to put them on and little stools. And you can just do a, almost like a kind of a very rustic kind of wild flower looking thing. And you can do it, you can put it in one section and then you have the rest open. And again, you're not just relegated to flowers. You can do a mixture of put some flowers in some, put some plants, some food in the other. Um, here's another one where it looks like they turned a bench into a, a, into a planter by putting some sides on it. And there they have everything growing in there. They have uh, uh, everything from flowers to, to spinach to looks like some sort of cabbage growing in there, to tomatoes on the other end. So again, it's, it's, you're only limited by your own imagination. And uh, if you follow the guidelines that I give you, like companion planting, companion planting would work great in something like this, especially if you're putting them in, in close proximity. Uh, it would be very nice. Then we have here, this is another one, just using modular, just using plastic planters. Again, you can stack them. They're easy to clean. Uh, they're easy to take apart. So if you want to add two more, you could just keep going across or you could go up uh, as high as you want. It looks like they have a bush in one, almost like a tree. Uh, looks like it's a tomato, I'm sorry, tomato plant with the, with the cage. It looks like they have basil in the other one, flowers in that one. So uh, that, that tomato is nice. It looks like they trimmed it really well. It's good and trimmed. You always want to prune those tomatoes because they'll take over. Uh, again, here's another one where it's all planters. 
so if you like terracotta, you know, do a mixture of terracotta pots and a mixture of, uh, of plastic and mix them in with each other. It's just, you know, it has a nice look to it. And then we have here, uh, let's see. oh yes, another thing that's very coming into style is corrugated uh, steel, um, um, what do you call it? These are like really watering troughs. They'll be used on farms to, for watering cattle and sheep and whatever. Um, and the nice thing about them is they were discovered now you can use them if, for a more permanent type of garden, nice and deep. Um, it doesn't mean you have to go all the way down with soil. What I would do is I would fill the first half of that with old pieces of wood and, and debris and branches, and then it'll go up the last foot with soil because no reason to have it that, that deep. No roots are going to go down that deep. The roots for the most of your vegetables are going to go eight to 12 inches tops. Uh, so you, you can use the rest just as filler. So you don't spend a ton of money on all these soils and you have all that weight too. So you have a lot of voids in there. You put a lot of pieces of old rotten firewood or pieces of logs, pieces of branches, throw that in there, a little straw, then start to put your soil on top. Nice thing about this one is because they're so big, you don't have to worry about in the winter if you have something, a, a, a perennial where the roots are gonna freeze because remember, the, the frost is going to get all around it, not just on top. When in the ground, you only worry where it makes contact. Usually four or five inches down, it's not frozen. Uh, but here, this can help with that situation because it's nice and deep. And being that it's corrugated steel and it's uh, galvanized, it's not going to rot and it's non-toxic. So you really have a real good long-term garden uh, situation here. So it really works really well. And I like them. They come in round, rectangular. Uh, you get them at Tractor Supply. They have a good have a good selection and they have good prices on it. And then this one I put in because in the winter, if you want to bring things inside that you're afraid to leave outside, that might be a little delicate. As long as you have a nice big window or a big pair of French doors or whatever you can do there, you may have to give it a little bit with, do a little bit with um, adding some uh, artificial light, a little bit of UV. Um, but you can get a UV lamp. They're very inexpensive at Nolts or one of those places, uh, farm, uh, farm supply there. Uh, you can find them. They're not that, that costly and they don't use as much electric because I think they tend to be LED now. So, uh, but this gives you an idea. You can even somebody use the growth plants in and put them in their workspace. So that's, uh, that's one of the things you can do. Okay, so that's what I have to show with slides. Now I want to talk a little bit about the tools that we use. But before we do, I wanted to show one thing which I uh, share with everybody. And this is for any gardener. Two things you need and again, are they're very important. You need this. You need the old farms that well, whether you have a, a little balcony garden or big garden or a farm, this is a wealth of knowledge. And it, it, having a farmer's almanac is really good and they really work. They're really great. A lot of information on when to plant, when to harvest, um, planting by the phases of the moon, planting uh, all types of things and it's all tried and true. Um, this here, my wife found this and it's a great tool and I recommend everybody get it. It's called Clyde's Garden Planner. And there's actually a guy named Clyde who invented this. It's like a slide rule for gardeners. So what does it do? Well, you see this red line? You have this red line here. I'm trying to do it so you can see the red line. The red line is the last frost date. What you do is you line up the line with the last frost date. Let's say May 10th is the last frost date in this area. So I lined it up with May 10th. So what does it tell me? So after that, I say, okay, I want to put my tomatoes out. When do I put my first planting? And it says June 7th is when I should do my first planting. When will I get my first tomatoes? August 2nd. So he gives you kind of a guideline and it works with all the popular um, vegetables that people tend to put most in their garden. It also shows you companion planting. It also shows you planting by the phases of, this, uh, of the moon, how far apart to plant plants, how far apart to plant rows, and so on and so on. Um, and then on the other side, it has fall planting. So things that you might plant mid-season, you follow the same thing. You're going to put instead of finding when the first last frost is, you go to when the first frost is, and it works in the opposite direction. Now you get this from Clyde himself, 
um, or you can get them on Amazon, $6. It'll be the best $6 you ever spent. And I'm, I can't believe somebody didn't come up with this before. It's such a great tool. And I show this at every talk and everybody winds up ordering one because it's like a little indispensable little tool. So you keep it in with your toolbox when you're working out in your garden. So you have this with you. It's like, a, it is a slide rule for gardeners. So at this time, I wanna show a little bit, take a few minutes to show um, what kind of tools that we use when we work in the garden. And, and what we do, we have a greenhouse at the farm and we have raised beds in it. So what we'll do is we'll bring a lot of the work we'll do, we have to do by hand because we're working with seedlings, uh, small plants and, and lettuce, the things that are delicate that we're planting by hand uh, for baby greens and, and such. Um, so I, I have this old toolbox that I bring with me when I go to work in the greenhouse. And it's just an old screw box. My father was a carpenter and this is the old box that we had. So I repurposed it to be, um, to use for uh, cleaning with garden tools. So when you have garden tools, what you really want to have are some good shovels. And you can get um, I got a little bunch of stuff in here. So a nice shovel. You know, you just can get this at your hardware store. Even Home Depot has them. Don't get plastic. Try to get something that's metal. Uh, there's a company that uh, is in in Harrison, New Jersey, Osborne Tool Company. And they've been around since 18. Nobody knows about these people because they make mostly upholstery and masonry tools, but they do have a selection of garden tools. The hardest part is finding a distributor, but they make the tools here in Harrison, New Jersey, which is right by Newark since 1827. And the factory is in ancient and they even have the foundry in there where they, where they actually pour the molten metal and they still do everything by hand and everything is a number, you know, they have all the tools, but you don't have to go that to that extreme, but you want to get yourself something that's going to last maybe with a wooden handle, nice steel, don't get anything plastic. It's, all, it's just going to break down. Um, so you want to have, and there's another shovel I have in here that I wanted to show. Uh, a shovel that has um, built-in ruler on it, which is great. So because if you're trying to figure out Oh, you know, I want to plant this and here it is. It has a little ruler right on the shovel. Can you see that, the inches? So if, I, if, if a particular plant says planted three inches deep, you know what to do. You use this shovel to make the initial hole. If you have to make it wider, use the other one. And then always have a nice little small rake to break away any, any debris or any, way, any um, weeds that you can break up. You can use a small tool like this and these are readily accessible to get to it on those suppliers. Uh, a small, since you're working in a small place, you're not gonna use a big hoe. You use a small hoe like this that you can actually get into your, your pot or your little um, rectangular pot or your round pot. Uh, you can use something like this and you can use it to, on the, uh, this way to scrape the weeds. You can use it to make a furrow to plant some seed in. Um, so you wanna have something like that. Um, also, you can get, um, this is a great tool for cutting weeds. You can find it's a weed cutter. You can also use it for cutting asparagus. Uh, that's, this is a great thing for really getting through down deep and breaking those weeds out and getting them out. But sometimes even in a small space garden, you can have problems with weeds. You know? Then you might want to get something that's called the dibble. If you're planting bulbs, if you're doing ornamentals and flowers that, that come in bulbs, tulips, whatever. Uh, irises, things like that, that have bulbs. You can use this to make the hole in the ground by just jabbing it. You drop your bulb in and then you just cover it. So having a good, what's called a dibble is a good tool to have. Um, and you can also have um, weed scrapers. Well, you get yourself a nice bulb planter if you're planting bulbs. It's just a, a way to nice auger. You just make the hole, drop your bulb in and then you just push the soil right back into the hole can use that too. And again, these tools are not expensive. They are really, and also if you're doing some of the bushes we were talking about, raspberries um, and, and strawberries and um, blackberries, and even trimming the, um, the, the, the tomato plants, you wanna get yourself a nice set of good sharp clippers. Uh, you can use regular scissors, but this, these tend to work better, especially if, if you're doing bushes that have a little bit of 
you know, that are a little tough, these are going to just go right through it. So have a nice pair of good garden snips with you. Um, again, not that they're not expensive. Get yourself a good uh, small garden knife, um, preferably with something serrated, especially if you have to cut through some brush and things like that. Um, there are other tools that we have, but uh, John, Johnny sent me this one. This one's called the Cobra, Cobra, Cobra head. Uh, I don't know where they put the safety thing on. It's supposed to be, a, um, looks like the head of a Cobra snake. Try to get this off here. It's called the Cobra head. It's just a little hoe to, to, to break up the soil with and pull any weeds out. And again, this is made out of recycled rubber and plastic. So it's, uh, it's very, very uh, green. So it's a good tool and uh, it's called the Cobra Head. And again, it works really great for, for removing weeds and, and such from your, from your pot or your garden where you're working. You can always have, it's always good to have markers that you put, you buy these little plastic markers. Like this one, we use it for red Russian kale. So we know a lot of times, believe it or not, if you don't do it, you forget. And I try to keep notes too, I keep a notebook and I put these on, but sometimes you say, you know, what did I plant there? I don't remember, I have to wait for it to come up now. And you can get yourself a nice, what's called a garden marker. So this won't uh, wash away. It's like a Sharpie, but it'll, it's, it works outdoors. So it's, it's really uh, perennial <laughs> in the sense that it lasts forever. So it's just a regular Sharpie type marker, except it's, it's, it's impervious to any kind of, you know, rain and wind and water and all that stuff. Uh, so these are the tools that I, I recommend that you can get. Um, some of them you can find at a good garden center. Some of them you can probably get at Nolts or a place like Johnny's. Even some of the other seed catalogs would have it. Um, my suggestion is when you look for tools, if you get them at Nolts, you'll probably save more money than if you got them at Johnny's because Johnny's tends to be a little bit more expensive. Um, so you might want to shop around a little bit. A uh, good thing to have is a seed dispenser. These are very inexpensive to buy. You remove the top, you fill the little hopper with some seed, and then you put the top in and the top has different holes to match the size of the seed. So what you do is if the seed is small or medium, whatever, you turn it to that seed. And then you, you as you tap them, they come out. <coughs> and it's got a lot of ridges on the end. So it stops them all from coming out. So they tend to fall one or two at a time when you give them a little tap. So having a little seed dispenser like this is a good tool to have too. So um, basically you make yourself a nice little kit and you keep it nice and clean. Always keep the tools clean because you don't want rust and you don't want, you want it to last a long time. But a lot of these tools we've had since we first started the farm. I mean, this one we've had for 12 years. So you can see some of them are newer, but uh, some of them like we've used this one many times. In the so it's fun because then you have your tools that for your particular job that you're doing, you know, your garden. And more. The thing with the garden is to remember to have fun with it and try to grow things that you really like to eat. Like, like if you like tomatoes, you can do grow yourself some tomatoes. Then you can do canning and jarring because believe it or not, even in a small space garden, you will have enough yield that you can do some canning, some jarring, some preserving. <coughs> um, and you just have fun. It kind of continues the season after you're done growing. So let me get this out of my way. So that's what I have to say about that. So at this time, I guess what I've said, I think I've said enough, I think I've talked enough. One more thing, if you wanna start your own plants, you can get what's called a heat mat. So if you wanna start your own little plants indoors, you can buy, uh, my last thing I wanna talk about is the uh, get yourself a heat mat and you can actually plug it in and it comes with a thermostat. So you can start your plants indoors um, from seed. Because one thing you, what you want to really do is when you're starting plant, whether it's for a traditional garden or a small space garden, if you're starting plants in, indoors, you have to have consistent heat 24 hours a day. I've had friends of mine who said, you know, I started my tomato plants, but they're not doing well inside. And I'll say that's because at night you turn the heat down before you went to bed. So it, instead of it being 70 degrees in there, maybe it's 66. And the plant doesn't like that. It wants continuous to 70 degrees to germinate. So that heat mat will do that. And uh, you can put up to two flats of, of uh, plants, little seedlings, and, and you can have fun with it. Lasts for years. So 
that's I think the last thing I can oh, I'm going to talk about tonight. So if anybody has any questions, um, please you can unmute yourself or you can um, ask in the chat. <laughs>